just now. Brothers and sisters, now we are moving on. My apology. Yes. Brothers and sisters, now we are moving on to the very interesting session, which is the question and answer session. There are four mics which are available uh, in the center, two for the ladies and two for the guys. And those who intend to ask their questions can kindly queue up at the available mic. I will read out the guidelines which are to be followed and the mic handlers will assist and ensure in, uh, uh, in ensuring that the session goes on smoothly. Today, because the non-Muslims are our guest, they will be given the priority. So I would like to request the mic handlers to pay attention. If there is any non-Muslims in the audience or in the queue, please give them specific priority to ask question. In the interest of getting a proper and clear answer from the speakers, I would like to request those who are asking question to kindly state your name and profession before you put forth your question. Questions should be asked on the topic of the day. Questions which are not related to the topic of the day will not be entertained. Kindly state your question briefly and to the point. I would like to remind everybody that this is a question and answer session, not a debate or a dialogue session. Therefore, kindly avoid giving a mini lecture. You may ask only one question at a time. To be fair to the others, if you have more than one question, I would like to request that you kindly go back to the queue and wait for your turn for your second chance of questioning. As I mentioned, there are four mics available. We will start with the ladies first on the right side, the first mic, and then we will go clockwise, the gents, the first mic on the front, then the ladies behind, the third mic, and the gen final, the fourth mic. Please ask your question once the mic handler allows you because we will go according uh, to the queue. To ensure that no time is wasted and our session is more educative in nature, our decision not to allow any question, any irrelevant question will be final. With this, I like to invite brothers and sisters, this is your opportunity. You know, we waited very long for Dr. Zaki Naik to deliver his lecture. Due to some reasons, his traveling is restricted. And after more than a year, we now have a major lecture of Dr. Zaki Naik in Malaysia. So this is your opportunity. Please come forward and state your question. Now, do we have any questioner on the sister side? If no, then we will start with the brother on the front side. Kindly speak to the mic. State your name, your profession, and your question straight to the point. Brother, you can on the mic, uh, the first mic for the brother, the front mic. Assalamu alaikum to all the audience and especially to my beloved, respected brother, Zakir Naik, Dr. Zakir Naik. It's been a long time since I see you. Last time I used to see you in Penang. Now you are no more for coming to Penang. You know, there are some problems. Okay. But I am from Penang. I come all the way to see you personally with my whole family. They want to see you live. Masha Allah, always watching in TV. Now they want to see you live. Okay, Alhamdulillah. My question is, 
Masha Allah, the subject today is Islam is a solution for humanity, but it is very unpleasant that we are seeing in this world today what is happening in Syria, Muslims killing Muslims, what is happening in Yemen, Muslim killing Muslims, what is happen in, happening in uh, they are they're like Myanmar, yes, we agree. Rohingyans, they have been killed mercilessly, we agree. But there is a solution. Now what are we Muslims are supposed to do? What is going on in Yemen? What is going on in Syria? These helpless men, women and children being killed, murdered. What are we Muslims supposed to do? All over the world, we Muslims. What we are doing? So, please give a solution that what we are supposed to do, we Muslims, apart from we making dua, tahajjud, we begging to Allah, and after that, as human beings, what are we supposed to do? Please, my dear brother, give a solution. The brother, the brother asked a very important question, a very relevant question that today we find that in many of the Muslim countries we find that there are wars and Muslims are being killed whether it be Yemen, whether it be Syria, whether it be Rohingya, whether it be Afghanistan, whether it be Iraq and most of these countries are Muslim countries what is the solution besides doing dua? Number one, first we have to find out that what is the cause of most of these killings whether it be in Afghanistan whether it be in Iraq, whether it be in Rohingya Burma, whether lately it be in Syria or Yemen, what is the cause? The major cause is, again, the solution is given in the Quran. The cause is that we find that the enemies of Islam, the, my main focus of my talk today was that how the enemies of Islam are trying to malign Islam and how the enemies of Islam are justifying to attack the Muslim countries. I'll give you one simple example. You know that more than a decade earlier, USA said that Iraq has the weapons of mass destruction. And CIA, which is supposed to be one of the most best organization of intelligence, they said that we have got proof that Iraq has got weapons of mass destruction. Not that I'm a fan of Saddam Hussein. I know that he may not be a very good practicing Muslim. But what right does USA have to interfere with Iraq? They together with UK and the other Western countries attacked Iraq. Saying that they had weapons of mass destruction. Last year, According to the report by human rights organization, they said it was a fabricated report. So much so that Tony Blair, the previous Prime Minister of UK, came out in public when he was no longer the Prime Minister. He said, it is the biggest mistake of my life, I'm sorry. You know how many people were killed? More than half a million Iraqis and Muslims were killed because of this fabricated report. And what is the reply? Sorry. What are we Muslims doing? When the non-Muslims enemy attack a Muslim country, we Muslims are sitting on our backside doing nothing. And I think it was yesterday the previous president of USA, W. Bush, at the age of 94, he expired. He was one of the cause for the start of the 9-11. Then followed by attack on Iraq by the next presidents of USA. This, what was the main purpose? Was to get hold of the oil of Iraq. They fabricate a thing and it was shown that they paid 540 million dollars. USA paid 540 million dollars to create a fabricated video to prove that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. 540 million dollars to make a video.
we Muslims, what is the fault of the Muslims? We are not united. In Afghanistan, when Afghanistan had a war with Russia, Soviet Union, which was the, which was the enemy of USA, the USA takes help of the Muslim country along with Afghanistan to take out Russia. Hillary Clinton said in a video that they spent eight billion dollars in supporting the Afghanistan and creating Taliban to fight the Russian. They create and then say that they are terrorists. Who is the bigger terrorist? The person who does the act or one who creates? The person who makes the person a terrorist. Who is the bigger terrorist? What are we doing? Nothing. They sent clusters bomb in the country which is one of the weakest countries in the world, Afghanistan. They sent cluster bomb. The bomb goes down and then it disintegrates into various bombs, killing thousands, tens of thousands of Ghani. What did the Muslims do? Nothing. The problem is that we Muslims are united. All these, what you find, all the war zone, when the Muslims are being killed, who is supporting the killing of the Muslims? Not Muslims. Who's the one who engineered most of the places? You'll find it's a fabricated things created by the news of Islam to attack the Muslim country, whether it be for oil, whether it be for money, whether it be for power, whether to attack or destroy the enemies. So previously, the biggest enemy of the USA before 9-11 was communism, was Russia. So they joined hands with the Muslim countries to take out Russia. The solution to this problem is given in the glorious Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number three, verse number 103, where Allah says, Wa tasimu bi hablillahi jamia wa la Hold to the rope of Allah strongly and be not divided. The rope of Allah is the glorious Quran and the authentic hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa if we Muslims hold strongly to the rope of Allah and the authentic sayings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we will be on top of the world. If you read the history, before the Quran was revealed, the Arabs were looked down upon. It was called as Jawmil Jahiliya, the days of ignorance. After the Quran was revealed, the Arabs became on top of the world. If you read the seer of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulfa Rashidin, and after that, Muslims were on top of the world. We rule half the world and people welcomed us, come to our country so that we get justice. The non-Muslims invited our Khalifas. Why? Because they wanted the unjust rule of their ruler to end. The Westerners say Islam was spread by the sword. Delisi already gives the reply in his book on page number eight, Islam at the Crossroad, that people who... <laughs> Delisi already said that history makes it clear. History makes it clear that the myth that Islam was spread by the sword is the most absurd, fantastic myth that the historians have ever repeated. It's a myth. At that time, the Muslims were united on the base of Quran and Sunnah. Today, we Muslims are divided. If the Muslim countries, there are more than 50 countries in the world in which majority people living are Muslims. If all the Muslim countries unite, we will be a very strong force. And if we implement the Quran, we will find this is the solution to the problems of humanity. Unfortunately, our beloved Prophet Muhammad said that close to the Qiyamah, we will find that Muslims will be in large numbers. And we find today, more than 25% of the world population are Muslim, and it's going to increase. But they will be like froth. Froth. Far away from the deen. And we find that today. Muslims are going further and further away from the deen. And this you are finding everywhere in the world. The country that we looked on upon, they are sticking to Quran and Sunnah today, they are going away from Quran and Sunnah. And the more they will go away from Quran and Sunnah, the more we will be degraded, they will be more injustice in that country. Now hardly there are countries in the world which we can say are Muslim countries that are following Quran and Sunnah. Hardly. So the problem with us Muslims is that we 
are not united. We are divided. We fight amongst ourselves. If we are united, today we know that previously Muslims were at least united on the issue of Palestine. Today we are divided. There are Muslim countries which are saying no problem that Israel wants to take over the country. What's happened to the Muslim Ummah? The problem is today we Muslims fear more the human beings in this world than fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, everyone will be judged according to the capacity you have. Everyone has the capacity to do dua. We should do dua as you mentioned. Rightly said. But if someone has the capacity to speak and if he does not speak, Allah will take over his power of speech. If someone has the capacity to fight and he doesn't fight, Allah will take over his power. You know today the Muslims, at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Muslims were poor. What Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left behind was the Sahaba, was the Khulfa Rashidin. Today, we Muslims are the richest in the world. We have the black gold, we have the oil, we have the petrol, what are we? Nothing. We have been used as domats. Wealth is not required for us to follow Quran and Sunnah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I will not fear for my own ummah poverty as Today the problem in us is because we are wealthy, we have forgotten Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Those Muslim countries which have the wealth, those Muslim countries which have the wealth which they can use in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are using it in the wrong way. I don't have to give examples, the world knows about it. They are using it to bribe the other people, not for the deen. Allah doesn't require us. You and me, the rubbish that we are, Allah does not require us to make his deen prevail. Allah is very clear. And Allah says in the Quran in no less than three different places. In Surah Tawbah chapter number 9 verse number 33. In Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 29. And Surah Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, Allah says, Huwa allazi arthala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq liyudhira wa ala deen kulli. That Allah sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions, all the other isms. And Allah says, The waqafa billahi shayda. And enough is Allah's witness once. And Allah says twice, how am I the mushrik don't like it? Allah has given a promise that this deen of Islam will prevail over all the other religions with or without us. Allah does not require you and me the rubbish that we are. His deen Allah is sufficient will make it prevail. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit's reward. Allah is giving us the opportunity to make hay while the sun is shining. And wallahi, we Muslims are going away and away from Allah and His Rasul. The only solution is we go back to Allah and His Rasul, go back to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, and inshallah you'll find that there will be peace. And the Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that before the world ends, Muslims will rule the full world for seven years. And that would be the best years. And we pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, we don't know when that will come, we pray that may Allah make us live. To see those tears. So the solution is the Muslims should be united on the basis of Quran and the Sahih Hadith. Hope that answers the question. Can we move on to the mic behind for the ladies? Yes. Kindly state your name, your profession, and your question briefly. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakin Nai. Uh, my name has to be kept secret for a few reasons, and I hope my face is not recorded. I am a student and to Dr. Zaki Nai, first of all, I am sorry because you are the person I hated the most a few years back. Before I became a Muslim, I really don't like you, I really hate you and when any of my friends try to praise you, I will make sure I done great you. So my question to you today is, despite of all this kind of hatred of others towards you, how do you continue doing this da'wah to the entire nation, people and everyone? And one more thing, Dr. Zake, 
uh, I would like to sincerely say I'm sorry for all the hatred in the past. Sister asked a very good question. She said that previously in the past she used to hate me and she used to speak against me and anyone who praised me she used to attack them and attack me and I believe that now she is a Muslim and she's apologizing for that sister. First I'd like to say that thank you for giving me all those hatred because when a person truly hates someone and he believes in it but if he's logical inshallah there are chances they will come to the true part. And I'll give you a very good example. The best example I can give you is Hazrat Umar Radhilawan. He was the second caliph of Islam. He was one of the staunchest enemy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Islam. So much so that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did dua to Allah that give hidayah to one of the Umarain out of the two Umar. Give hidayah to one and Allah give hidayah to Umar bin Khattab Radhilawan. And when the person who used to hate Islam, ready to kill in the name of Islam, when he accepted Islam, he was one of the staunchest supporters of Islam. So I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may he make you, like Hazrat Umar Lawan, that one who was the staunch enemy of Islam against Da'is, inshallah you will be one of the staunchest supporters of Islam, inshallah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that once a person accepts Islam, all his or her previous sins are washed away. All the negative is washed. The more bad they did, that much positive they get. That means the person before, before accepting Islam, the more evil he did, he was so far away from the deen. When he accepts Islam, that the negative he did, all becomes positive. Means the more you abuse me or Islam, Inshallah, you will get that many positive points after you accept Islam, Inshallah. Regarding a main question, that how do I when there are many people who are hating me, how do I yet do Dawa? And that's a very good question. And when I was new in the field of Dawa many years back when I started preaching, you know, there were few people listening, then became hundred, then became thousand, and hundred thousand and million. So I have to think, okay, first when I started out of hundred, one percent you know, was my enemy. So hundred people, one person enemy, when thousand there'll be ten enemies. When million, one person or million, ten thousand, ten thousand enemies. So yes, my popularity is increasing and percentage wise the enemies are increasing. That was my understanding, which I was wrong. When we do the analysis of the Seerah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we come to know that when he started preaching Islam, five of them accepted Islam. There were no enemies. As he kept on growing, spreading the truth, the enemies increased. Today, the person who is the most influential in the world, it is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not only agreed by the Muslims, even by non-Muslims. Michael H. Hart in his book, The Hundred Most Influential People, he puts our Nabi Kari Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as number one. He's a non-Muslim, but puts Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam number one most influential human being in the world. Do you know the person against whom the maximum books are written? The person who is criticized most today in the world, who is it? Who is that person? Who is it? Who is the person today in the world who is criticized the most? Who is attacked the most? Who is it? Who is it? Sorry? Can't hear you. Donald Trump, they say. Donald? Donald Trump. Donald Trump. How many books written against him? Today, the person who is the most attacked and hated in the world is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the enemies of Islam. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 31, that to every prophet we have appointed an enemy. And since Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the last prophet, he has to have enemies. I told the presence of Arun Shuri in India proves that the Quran is right. If people like Arun Shuri who write books against Islam did not exist in the world, the Quran would have been proved wrong. Quran says for every prophet we have appointed an enemy. So then I realized the more you spread the truth, 
and people start liking you, the enemies start hitting you. Alhamdulillah, when I did a little bit of survey in the, in the website, mashallah, the following kept on increasing. It is all because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am nothing. I don't deserve it, not even 0.001% of it. We started, it increased, and as the MC said, now it is, alhamdulillah, 17.5 million on the Facebook. By Allah's grace, the largest any religious personality, whether Muslim, Christian, or Hindu. The second is a Christian, Joel Oyston, 16.9 million. But when you go on the net, and when I did a survey, out of every 10 websites, at least two websites are against me. Maybe 20%, it, it may increase. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the followers are 1.8 billion, maybe 2 billion, some non-Muslim loving, but yet the people hitting him are more today. The books written against him. And that reminds me of a scholar that you asked me the question, how when people hate you, why it continues? There's a scholar who's, who quoted that Hazrat Umar radiallahu the second caliph of Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created a sect who cursed Hazrat Umar radiallahu so that he gets sawab. One scholar said the reason Allah created a sect to curse Hazrat Umar radiallahu so that more they curse in the akhira, he will get reward. So in the way Allah is rewarding him, when a person does the haq, the, the word of truth, people speak against him, it will be converted on the day of judgment in his favor. Because anyone who criticizes me speaks against me and it's in the wrong, on the day of judgment, his good deeds will come to me. When his good deeds end, my bad deeds will go to him. So, though I don't want anyone to curse me, but when they curse me, because of the teachings of Islam and our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it makes me a stauncher die. And the more you spread, you'll have to get difficulties. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 155, Surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of lives and goods, and what you have earned or toiled for. Allah will test you. Allah will test you with fear and hunger. And we find that more difficult the test, more is the higher reward in the akhirah. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, all the ambiyas, all the messengers were tested much more than any other non-messenger in the world. So more difficult the test, higher the reward. And today, I always thank Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala that whatever little bit I've done, it is hadha min fazli rabbi. It's only because of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And I left my profession People told I'm a fool. I left my medicine profession and became a dai. I became from doctor of a body to doctor of a soul. They called me a fool because when I wanted to become a doctor, I thought it was the best profession in the world to, to serve the sick people. It is a good profession. But when I found a better profession of a dai, I gave up my medical profession to become a dai. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me much more than what I could have thought of. I'm sure if I was a doctor, you all wouldn't have come here in Pearl to hear me. They wouldn't have people. We did it for the sake of Allah. Allah gives you multiple times more. And today the problem, because we're spreading the truth, there are people against us, there are people accepting Islam in large numbers, alhamdulillah. Peace TV today, the network has more than 200 million viewers. Every day, hundreds of non-Muslims accepting Islam. This doesn't go down the throat of the enemies of Islam. Whether it be the Western countries, whether it be a country where I was born in India. They don't like it. I like the constitution of my country, India. It is one of the few countries in the world we give the citizen the right to preach, practice and propagate the religion. I did not break a single law of the country. But because I was spreading peace, I was giving solution for humanity. All the people who don't like peace to prevail, they don't like me. So more they strive against me, I'm striving harder to spread the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more difficulties they put to me, thinking that they will, they will maybe make me break down, it is making me a more firm die. 
Because Ayad ibn Taymiyyah, you know, the many people who attacked him, they threatened him that they will put him in jail and they threatened him that they will kill him, they will exile him. Ibn Taymiyyah, Shaykh al Islam, and I say that I'm nothing, I'm nowhere compared to him. I'm just 0.0001%. And I say the same thing what he said that what can you do to me? If you put me in jail, I will do zikr of Allah. If you exile me, I'll do tafakkur, contemplate on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you execute me, I will become a shaheed. My jannah is in my heart. They cannot take my jannah away from me. I, as a da'i of Islam, looks at the seerah of the Prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The more they attacked the Prophet, the Prophet was kind. The Prophet was compassionate. We are no way close to the Prophet. But we as da'i, we cannot retaliate. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Fusila, chapter number 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with goodness. You may never know who is your enemy, he will become your friend. And you are one of the best examples for the fulfillment of this verse of the Quran. Of Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 34, that repel evil with goodness, the person who is your enemy will become your friend. And sister, I only follow the glorious Quran and the Sai Hadith to the best of my ability. And the more you follow, because our main goal and my lecture tomorrow, the purpose of our life, you should hear that. What is the purpose of our life? So if your purpose of our life is Akhirah, this dunya is nothing. You strive for the Akhirah, Allah will give you dunya and Akhirah. And I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that may He make me serve Islam as much as I can, though Allah doesn't require me the rubbish that we are. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may utilize every breath of my life to spread the deen to the best of my ability. Hope that answers the question, sister. Thank you, Dr. Zake, for everything, and I hope you forgive me. Sister, I've already forgiven you, and I pray for you, and I pray that Allah has more people like you coming close to Islam, inshallah. Can we have the brother on the mic uh, behind? Kindly state your name, your profession, and your question straight to the point. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My name is Ahmad Farhan B. Ahmad Sabri. I'm, my profession is stud a student from University of Malaysia. From past uh, Dr. Zakir talk, uh, you said that some of the Christian rules are pretty much same with uh, our Islamic Sharia, uh, such as uh, uh, punishment for a thief, which is cut their hand. My question is, why their priests did not want to talk to the to talk to, uh, about this uh, to their followers, which is uh, contained contain in the Bible. Thank you. Brother, there was a question that in my speech I said that some of the teachings of Christianity same as Islam, for example, cutting the hand, I never said that, brother. I said some of the teachings are same in all the religions, not to rob, not to cheat, not to molest a woman, not to rape. I never said that cutting of the hands is there in Christianity. I never said that. I said Islam, besides teaching good things, shows you a way how to achieve that goodness. Just by saying not to rob is not sufficient. See, in every law, every country has its law. It may not be perfect, but the laws, and most of the countries, almost all countries say don't rob. After that, what? After that, what? Only by saying not rob, will it be sufficient? No. As a deterrent, they have punishment. Some countries will say, if you rob, then one year imprisonment. Some country will say two years, some country will say three years. In Islam, it says if you rob and if you fulfill the criteria that you have done all these wrong things, then the punishment is chopping off the hand. Surah Maida chapter 5 verse 38, which is a deterrent. And the makasid of Sharia is not to chop people's hand. It is to make them fearful so that they do not do the crime, so that the problem of the humanity is solved. I never said that Christianity also said that you should chop the hand. That's a misunderstanding. I said most of the religions speak good things, but they do not give a solution how to achieve that goodness. Hope that answers the question.
Is that brother uh, in the white in the queue? Yes. Please go ahead. Kindly state your name and profession and your question to the brother. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Uh, my name is Muhammad. I'm a student in University of Malaysia, Berlis. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Dakir, I want to ask you, uh, uh, now uh, there is many of people, they affect by Western. Uh, they say Western is better, uh, the strongest. So we have to follow them, uh, follow Western rules. Uh, and uh, also today we, uh, our uh, lecturer is uh, Salam is the solution. So, uh, how can we uh, answer them and tell them Islam is the solution, especially in political? Most of most, uh, maybe Muslim uh, secular, they say uh, Islam only in masjid, not in political or all things uh, except only masjid what we have to say for them. Well, there are two questions. The first question is that today uh, the Western countries are strong, they are powerful, so we have to follow them. How can we say that Islam has the solution? As far as the first question is concerned, brother, I already give the reply that though these countries like USA say they are the most powerful country, it has the maximum number of theft in the world. What is the solution? Would you like to live in a country which has the maximum number of theft? You know, I've been to Western countries, USA, several times. Yes, it, uh, I know, but uh, you know, uh, you ask me the, the question, strongest. Whether you ask me the question. Yes, yes. Correct? So if, after I finish the answer, then you can. Oh, okay, okay. The reply I already gave in my talk. No. I gave the reply in my talk. I've been to USA several times. In most of the cities of USA, it is difficult to travel after midnight for fear that you will be attacked. So would you like to live in such a country? Out of the statistics that is there in USA, when a woman passes from university, more than 95% have already had a sexual intercost before marriage. 95%. Would you like to stay in such a society? I say it is nothing but a degradation of honor, deprivation of a soul, and exploitation of a body. So what they're saying, they advanced, is actually degrading them. We love our sisters, we respect our sisters. So if you follow Islam, Islam has the solution to the problems. If they say that if you see to it that a woman is not raped, is being subjugation, I love my woman to be subjugated. Because I don't like the woman to be raped. This is the reply. Coming to your second question. Coming to your second question. That some of the secular Muslims say that Islam is only meant to be followed in the mosque. These secular Muslims don't know what Islam is. For studying Islam, you have to go back to the Quran and the Sahih Hadith. And Islam is a deen, a complete way of life. It shows you the solution to all the aspects of life. Mosque is one aspect of ibadah. One aspect. Nowhere does the Quran or the Hadith say that Islam is restricted only to the mosque. Islam is a deen, a complete way of life. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna deena in the al Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the akhirah, he will be amongst the losers. So Islam is a complete way of life. And the best example is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That he led a life as a prophet, he led a life as a statesman, as a statesman, he led a life as a politician. Today's politics is dirty. That time, if you want to see, see the seerah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See the lifestyle of the four Khulfa Rashidin. You will come to know what a politician is. So if you want to emulate politics, see the life of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. See the life of the four Khulfa Rashidin. If you want to behave like a good father, look at Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Look at the Sahabas. If you want to be a good Muslim man, look at the Sahaba. So we find in Islam a complete solution. Those people who don't have enough knowledge of Islam, it is lack of knowledge that they say that Islam is restricted to the mosque. It's important, very important, but it is 
a complete way of life. Hope that answers the question. Jazakallah khair. Yeah. Thank you. Because we don't have much time, if there are sisters, you can kindly stand to the mic. We probably will have uh, one or two more questions uh, after this. So if there are sisters, you can kindly uh, stand and queue in the mic. Uh, meantime, I will proceed with the brother on the front mic. Kindly state your name, your profession, before asking you a question, brother. Assalamu alaikum. My name is uh, Osama Rida. I'm a degree student, business. Uh, just my question is about Salah. You've mentioned and give us uh, knowledge about Zakah and how it benefits our society. So what about Salah? Why we should gather in the mosque? What is the benefit of it for the community and the society? Thank you. Brother, that's the question that in my lecture I gave the example of Zakat. What about Salah? What is the benefit of Salah? Why should we go to the mosque and have a congregation and gathering? Brother, I've given a full lecture on Salah, the programming towards righteousness. It's for about one and a half. I don't intend doing that. You cannot cover all the points in one lecture. Salah is the second important, the second pillar of Islam. After Tawheed, believing in Allah, that there's no one except Allah subhanahu the worthy of worship, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa the messenger, the second is Salah. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, the first deed that will be asked you on the day of judgment is about your Salah. And according to Imam al-Bahabi, not praying falls as the fourth major sin in Islam. Number one is shirk. Second is murder. Third is black magic. Fourth is foregoing Salah. It is the fourth major sin in Islam. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume one in the book of Salah, that if you pray in Jama, you get 25 times, 27 times more sawab. So praying in Jama is 25 to 27 times better congregation. And there are several hadith of our beloved Prophet Muhammad there are hadith of Prophet Muhammad it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume 1 in the book of Salah, that the Prophet said that people do not come to the mosque for the Jummah Salah. He felt like telling one of the Sahaba to lead the Salah so that he would go and burn the houses of those people who did not come for the Jummah Salah. There's another hadith in which the Prophet Muhammad said. So based on the scholars, praying Jumma Salah is fard. And if you do it for three times without reason, Allah blocks your heart. And according to Imam al-Dhabi, it is the 66th major sin in Islam. Not paying, praying persistently Jumma Salah in congregation is the 66th major sin. Imam al-Dhabi also says sin number 65, one sin before that that persistently not praying in the mosque, in the congregation, salah with jama, without a valid reason. There's another hadith of Sahih Bukhari, volume one, book of salah. The prophet said, the hypocrites did not come for the fajr salah or the isha salah. And if they knew the reward, they would come crawling. I felt like telling one of the sahabas to lead the salah so that I can go out and burn the homes of the men with them in it who did not come for the congregation salah. So praying in jama, the five times salah, according to very few scholars it is mustahab sunnah. Majority scholars say it is fard. Imam al dhabi says in his book, in Qabair, it is the 65th major sin that if you do not pray five times salah in the congregation in the mosque. So most of the scholars agree that you have to pray unless you have a valid reason that if maybe you're traveling or if you're sick. Or normally at the time of the Sahabas, if a person did not come to the mosque to pray, he was either sick or he was a munafik. That's what the Sahaba did. So praying compulsory in the Salah, in congregation is a must. What are the various benefits? I can give a talk for one hour only on scientific benefits. Time doesn't permit me, but you can see my video cassette. You come closer to the Muslim Ummah, you get guidance from the Imam, your khushu increases. The best time, the best peace of mind is the time of Salah. And the best part of Salah is the sujood. Allah mentioned sajda and sujood in the Quran 92 times. But if you know what khushu is, you will understand it. 
You can only enjoy the fruit if you have a taste of it. So if you know what benefit of salah, one minor benefit, minor benefit I'll tell you. You know, people say, you know, the 10 richest men in the world, and list goes on, Mukesh Ambani, number 10, and Warren Buffett, and number one goes to Bill Gates. Now it is Jeff something. He's overtaken Bill Gates recently. Jeff someone, uh, who's the owner of Amazon. He's overtaken Bill Gates, number one. And there was another post that says, number 10, Ambani, number three, Bill Gates, number two, Jeff. Number one is who? A Muslim who offers two rakat of sunnah salah before fajr. Because the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you pray two rakat sunnah before fajr, it is more valuable than the earth and the wealth in it. So if you have a Muslim, you understand that, you will know the reward of that. It's the sunnah salah. Sunnah mawkida. So imagine what would be the reward for the fajr salah. But how many Muslims realize that? Many do, but not all. If you know that, you know, once a businessman approached me, he's a billionaire, you know, but the Zakir, I, I pray four times salah, but I cannot get up for fajr. So I told him, that what if you have a meeting tomorrow, early in the morning, at 5.30, where if the deal clicks, you'll get a billion dollar. He said, I will not sleep the full night. So I told him, you know, the sunnah salah of the fajr is more valuable than the world and the wealth in it. Trillions and zillions of dollars. So if you have that iman and if you have that faith, then you will realize what important it is. That's what the Prophet said. If the munafiq knew what was the benefit of coming for the Isha Salah and Fajr Salah to the mosque, they would crawl coming to it. So unfortunately, most of us Muslims don't know the benefit. But Alhamdulillah, I'm happy in Malaysia as compared to India. The percentage of Muslims praying in India is very small in the mosque. I would say less than 5%. But here, Alhamdulillah, I'm happy that the percentage of Muslim men Muslims praying in the mosque is multiple times more than India and Pakistan. But as a Muslim, the benefit you get, the sukoon, the serenity, the peace, it is much more than the wealth. So if you know what peace is, you will value it. If you don't know, you won't value it. So if a Muslim reads the Quran and the Hadith and understands what benefit it is, then you will care less for the material things. And you will come closer to the deen and you'll find the benefit. For more details, refer to my talk, Salah, the program into the righteousness. Hope that answers the question. Unfortunately, we have come to the last question of the day. And last two, is there? Okay. Okay. So can we have the brother uh, on the mind, mic behind? Yes. Please go ahead, state your name, your profession, and ask your question. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Dr. Zake. Uh, my name is Mohammed Niza. I just recently graduated from medical college. Uh, so my question is uh, regarding um, the haram about touching the dog. So when I listen to your answer, the saliva is haram pro probably due to the rabies. Uh, you said about hydrophobia. So now recently we know there is vaccine uh, produced against rabies. So what is your answer to it? But that was the question that I gave, one of the reasons that why we should not uh, touch the dog, and I said that licks the body, and one of the reasons that can be the, the reason not given the hadith, and I gave that the saliva has certain germs and rabies, etc. He being a doctor, I said that now we have a rabies vaccine, you know? So what is your reply? Brother, when you jump from the second floor, what will happen? You'll fracture your leg. You go to the hospital, you have treatment for the fractured leg. Will you jump from the second floor? No. Why? You're a doctor. Will you die? Chances are less. Second floor, you won't die, but you'll break a bone. So will you jump? No. Or you can go to the prostitute. Maybe you'll get STD. Is there treatment for STD? STD, sexually transmitted disease, gonorrhea. Treatment is there, not AIDS. 
Yes, yes. Will you go? No. If no. you have diabetes, okay, we'll give you insulin. Will you have extra sugar? Prevention is better than cure. You're a doctor. Yes. I'm also a doctor. Sure. So will you tell your doctor, oh, do everything, I'm a doctor, I will give you injection. So when the, when the patient comes with rabies, no problem, go to the doc, take more bites, I will keep on giving you injection. What will the patient tell you? What will the patient tell you? You're a good doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, patient will tell you the doctor wants to make money. Therefore, he's telling, okay. So prevention is better than cure. So in Islam, is the solution. The solution is stay away from it, don't take vaccine. Why you want to get injected with the disease and then take a medicine? Best is prevention is better than cure. Hope that answers the question. Thank you, Dr. Unfortunately, this will be the last question of the day. Brother, can you keep your question as short as possible? Thank you. Um, uh, actually, just now I didn't mention my name and my profession. I am actually, my name is Hassan and my profession is I am just a postman. Um, nothing to be a proud of and nothing to be ashamed of. And um, my question is, uh, brother, my respected brother Zakir, uh, you, in Torah, we have this uh, punishment of uh, adultery is stoned to death. But when it comes to Quran, the punishment is not stoned to death. It is mentioned weeping hundred times or uh, maybe caning, yeah, hundred times. But at the same time, what I am telling you is strengthened by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by saying that وَمَا يَنْتِكُ أَنِ الْحَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيُ يُوْهَا He does not speak of his own desire but whatsoever that I reveal to him through inspiration that he convey. So Allah says weeping. So how does this stone to death come in? That's my question. The brother asked a very good question. He said that if you read the Bible in the Jewish and the Christian scriptures, we come to know that for adultery it is that the punishment is going to death. In Islam, if you read the Quran, it says that there is hundred lashes. So where does the stone to death come? What you are referring to, uh, brother, if you read the punishment for zina, there are various verses in the Quran talking about it. One verse in the Quran in Surah Nur chapter number 24 verse number 1 says that when they are involved in zina, zina is of two types, adultery and fornication. Fornication means an illegal sexual intercourse before marriage. Adultery is an illegal sexual intercourse after marriage. Different between the two. It says that keep her in seclusion in a home until that takes place or until Allah gives something else. That means there's a punishment mentioned but there's a clause. Unless Allah gives another punishment. If you read Surah Noor chapter number 24 verse number 4 says that if you're involved in fornication, 100 lashes. Now this zina word, the Mufassirin has translated as fornication. Means illegal sexual intercourse before marriage. But in the hadith it says about adultery. So the punishment for adultery, illegal sexual intercourse after marriage is turning to death. So there are two different things. Illegal sexual intercourse before marriage is fornication, the word English. It is 100 lashes. But illegal sexual, sexual intercourse after marriage is a bigger sin. Because besides doing the sin, you are betraying your wife. That's why the punishment is turned into that that is given in various hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So both are not contradicting. There are different punishments for two different acts which come under the category of zina. Hope that answers the question. Actually, uh, there is an addition. There are some scholars, well-known scholars, uh, they say that they don't agree with stoning to death. They say they only abide by what is written by Allah, the punishment is lashes, hundred lashes. You they say, no, it is found in the Hadith and it is practiced by Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says, if you don't find the punishment in Quran, then you go to Hadith. But if the punishment is in the Quran, don't go to Hadith. Brother so, said, Soran is superior than Hadith. Brother, I said that he knows some scholars who say that if the punishment mentioned in the Quran, we have to go hadith. Brother, what you call scholars are not scholars. It's like me telling you, my mathematics teacher told me in my school two plus is equal to five. Will you ask me what is the degree of the teacher? If I tell you 
my mathematics teacher in my school, he is a great mathematician. He is told 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. What will you tell me? Brother, who you are telling a mathematician is not a mathematician. Why? Because you know maths. Brother, are you listening to me? Because you know maths, you will say, what Dr. Zakir is saying nonsense. How can a mathematician scholar say 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? Similarly, I having little knowledge of Islam, scholars who say that if it's given in the Quran, no need of going in the Hadith and turning to the not there. He's not a scholar at all. I don't want to ask his name also. It will surely not be amongst the well-known scholars. It will be those who don't have knowledge of Islam. And people who have less knowledge may be considering themselves to be a scholar. Some people say Salman Rajdi scholar, Tasliman Rasid scholar, for you, not for me. So these scholars who say, what is the ruling of the Quran and Hadith is when you want to know about Islam, number one is Quran, then is Hadith. I agree, there's no two doubt about it. But the Hadith will never contradict the Quran. No Sai Hadith will contradict the Quran. And the Quran is a telegraphic message. Quran says pray. How to pray does it mention? It may tell you about Qayyam, about Sujood. Does it say how many, how many rakah to pray in Fajr? Does it say? How many rakah to pray in Zohar? Does it say? No. Certain things it says, but not everything. More details go to the Hadith. So similarly, no Sai Hadith will contradict with the Quran. So many things in the Quran, the Quranic works itself is sufficient. Quran says give zakat. How much to give zakat does it say in the Quran? Nowhere does the Quran says give 2.5%. What are you going to do? Go on to the hadith. So here when we find that there is a hadith, which apparently for you and a normal person may think it's a contradiction, the scholars see the ruling and then they come with a solution. If the hadith contradicts the Quran, it cannot be a say hadith. But many a time the hadith doesn't contradict, it gives more information. So when the hadith is sahih, it will never contradict the Quran, it's giving more information. So when we have to derive a, a compromise between the Quran and hadith, we have to see to it and then the scholars give a solution. Because our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, Atiullah wa atiur Rasul. If Allah said only follow Allah, then Rasul wasn't required. What does Allah say? Atiullah wa atiur Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 59, Obey Allah, obey the Messenger and those who have been endowed with knowledge, all, all Amr, those who have knowledge. But it continues, but with those with knowledge, if they differ, you go back to Allah and His Rasul. So if it's the Sahih Hadith, it will never contradict the Quran. Like the answer I gave you, it's not contradicting. Now that person who you call a scholar may not be knowing the difference between fornication and adultery. What am I going to do? I don't want to ask them of the scholar also. Will you ask me, who is the scholar who says 2 plus 2 is equal to 5? If I tell you the name, will you believe? <coughs> what will you say? That person is not a scholar. So similarly, those who say that once it's given in the Quran, it cannot... Once it's given in the Quran, yes. If the Quran says, pray, why are you going to the Hadith? Hadith gives more details. Do you understand? So when Hadith gives more details, you have to follow Allah and His Rasul both. You cannot say only follow the Quran. If you follow only the Quran, many things of Islam you cannot do. So as a whole, as a Muslim, even in my talk I said, Allah and His Rasul. The glorious Quran and the authentic Hadith. Hope that answers the question. So, Wa akhir dawan, final, final, final. I just want to clarify, but as you say, in the Quran it's not mentioned two rakat, three, five, four. No, it's not mentioned. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa will show us as the guidance how to pray a Fajr, Lohar, Asr and all that. Yeah, I agree. But here, it's clearly mentioned 100 lashes. You know, Allah says it's 100. So, if, if some Brother, countries... did you hear my answer? No, no. I'm if up, some wait, country, wait, wait, wait. I'm no, sir. I'm one telling, minute. Did you I, hear? I just finish did, it. Did you, if one country... Let's not, to waste, practice, let's not waste the time. No, no. no there are one two, minute. There are two types of zina. Can you repeat which two types of zina are there? Can you repeat? Two penalties. Two types of zina. Zina, okay. What are the two types of zina I mentioned? Fornication and another three. Ah, what is the punishment for fornication? For fornication is hundred lashes. Where it is mentioned? It's not, uh, it's mentioned in the Quran. The punishment for adultery, where it is mentioned? It's not mentioned at all. It is mentioned in the hadith. Yeah, yeah. Ah. 
It's mentioned in the Hadith and also mentioned in the Quran. You forgot. The Quran says, put her into a confinement in the room until Allah gives another punishment. Ambiguous. Allah gives another punishment. It's ambiguous. Through, not ambiguous. Another punishment. Allah gives through a Nabi, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not ambiguous. That means the Quran is saying one more punishment is going to come. But you don't want to read the Hadith. Who's to blame? You or Allah? You. So when you read the Hadith, you come to know more details. So we as Muslims should follow Quran and Sunnah both together. Quran is number one. Then is Hadith. No Hadith will contradict the Quran. It is your lack of knowledge and lack of understanding. So if Quran says, if you don't know, Fas'alu al zikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. If you don't know, ask the person who is knowledgeable. So if you don't know, you have to ask a scholar. When you get sick, who do you go to? Do you go to a barber? Do you go to a cobbler? Who do you go to? Who do you go to? When, when, I when, you are sick, when you are sick, who do you go to? Doctor. Doctor, not to a barber. <laughs> so when you don't know about Quran, go to a scholar, not fake scholar. Don't go to a quack. Yeah. To a scholar who has knowledge of the Quran and Sayyid, then inshallah you'll get the reply. Hope that answers the question. Wa akhiru dawan, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. I'd like to thank Dr. Zakir Naik for his charismatic speech and for his convincing and comprehensive answers right up to the end of the program. I also like to thank the questioners for asking the questions, the audience for patiently being with us, and uh, please, uh, please forgive us if there is any shortcoming uh, from our side. I would like to congratulate uh, One Center Malaysia for organizing this event successfully, and the coming events such as, for example, there's a lecture by Dr. Zakir Naik tomorrow, 2nd of uh, December, in UITM Arau at 8 p.m. The topic is, what is the purpose of life? Then on the 3rd of December, at 7.30 p.m. in Masjid Rahmaniyah Kuala Polis, the topic will be the importance of unity in the Muslim Ummah. And finally, on the 5th of December, in Unimap, 8 p.m., the topic will be the Quran and modern science. Believe me, brothers and sisters, these are very, very interesting topics. And uh, try to attend the talks which you can. And inshallah, may, all, may we all benefit from learning new things. And may Allah give us, give us hidayah to carry on, pass on the message, the knowledge we learn to the other people who are not present here today. I'd like to thank everybody for your patience. And with this, i like to end uh, the today's session from my part before passing the mic uh, to Tuan Hakim, the other MC. Jazakallahu khairan. Wa akhiru dawa wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.